of all the movies that I've tweeted about in my entire life, you went with Liar Liar, Steve, <laughs> not Way of the Gun, not fucking, okay, what was it? Uh, not Way of the Gun, not, fuck. Oh, all those movies, all those movies. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Alan, John McClane kicked out. Welcome back to Shot the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental of Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, this is the podcast for you. I am one of your hosts, Gene Lyons. And alongside me are my co-hosts, Ash the Claw Reed. Hi, y'all. And Big D Dick Ebert. Good evening. And each week, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you'd like to see all the movies we have covered will cover or want to choose one for yourself, please visit shatpod.com and have a look. At the end of each podcast, we'll provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. That's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally, subscribe to our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we view TV series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, True Detective, Lovecraft Country, and Watchmen. Find all that information and past episodes at shatpod.com slash TV. And finally, the Hangout with us live, follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel, shatpod.com slash Twitch, where you play video games, host watch parties, and edit this podcast live. All that being said, Big D, what movie are you reviewing today? So, Gene, I don't even know where to start with tonight's commission. Uh, <laughs> the the merry band of our supporters are are very unique, and we we once got a group commission for Titanic. They did a recording. They sang to us. It was glorious. Uh, this week's a little different. We had a group of them come together, and the group doesn't seem to know who was part of the group, who contributed, who did what. So we have a combination of voicemails and emails. So we're going to start off with the the key ringleader which is Steve, of course. Hey, Shat Crew. It's Hot Tough Steve calling in for a Liar Liar Take Two. The first voicemail was probably gibberish because I was mm-hmm. at a brewery birthday party all day and I took home a bottle of Belgian Triple, a bomber, and was drinking that while watching Liar Liar and called in after. So, needless to say, that was a super drunk and probably incoherent voicemail. So, calling in again. Uh, there should be four of us that I know of that contributed to this podcast, myself, Jen, Andy, and Sarconic. So hopefully you get emails or voicemails for all of them for Liar Liar. So <laughs> I've watched it while I was really drunk. Oh, first off, this was inspired by a tweet that Gene sent out of Liar Liar, something to do with Liar Liar. I don't remember. It was just Jim Carrey, and I was like, we should commission that, but I didn't want to commission it by myself, so... I threw it out on Discord and Twitter and got a group of people, um, most, I, I know all of them, to uh, go in on it. So, Liar Liar, I was watching it really drunk. I thought it was good, not great. Um, still some laughs, but I like a lot of his other movies better. Dumb and Dumber is probably, it's one of my favorite all-time movies. Definitely, I think, Jim Carrey's best movie. Controversial opinion. Um, it's pretty much the same movie, just has a much better cast. Um, I like Yes Man a lot better. I laugh a lot more on it. it. It's silly as well, but I just like the plot a little better. We'll see what you guys think or the rest of the commissioners on this episode think. Can't wait to listen to it and uh, have a great rest of your day. So then Jen wasn't sure if she contributed and she <laughs> wrote in and said, hey, friend, so I actually forgot that I threw it on this group commission. I went back through my Venmo transactions to see when I did it, and I'm telling you guys now I was probably a little drunk, but I'm glad I did it. This is still a super fun movie for me, and I was recently able to trick both my teenage daughters into watching it, and they didn't hate it. I knew for sure that they were my children when they laughed out loud at one of the greatest lines, if not the greatest line in this film, that beautiful father and son moment when little Max looks up to his father with complete innocence and says, dad, my teacher says that real beauty is on the inside. Fletcher gazes down lovingly at his son 
with wholehearted sincerity and replies, that's just something that ugly people say. Love you guys. Thank you for being unapologetically you. Big D, Gene B, thank you for being good members of the Y chromosome squad. The world needs you. Bye, Gen D. P.S., thank you for making this commission happen. Hot sauce, Steve. So I think the key here is getting people drunk and then they commission stuff. So theory hmm. is the reason we had the spike in commissions. Is everyone was home during the pandemic getting shit housed and commissioning movies. So if you really want to think about a silver lining from COVID-19. Shot the movies. Shot the movies. Liar Liar is a 1997 fantasy comedy starring Jim Carrey as a lawyer who built his entire career on lying, but finds himself cursed to speak only the truth for a single day, during which he struggles to maintain his career and to reconcile with his former wife and son, whom he alienated with his pathological lying. The film is the second of three collaborations between Carey and director Tom Shadiak, the first being Ace Ventura Pet Detective, and the third being Bruce Almighty, which, by the way, is Jim Carrey's biggest movie. And it is the second of three collaborations between writers Paul Gway and Stephen Mazur, the others being The Little Rascals and Heartbreakers. Liar Liar was released to critical and commercial success, grossing $302.7 million against a budget of $45 million and earning positive reviews from critics and audiences who particularly praised Carrie's performance. At the 56 Golden Globe Awards, Carrie was nominated for Best Actor in a Comedy. So as I said on the Cable Guy episode, I checked out of Jim Carrey Mover. He's somewhere between Dumb and Dumber and The Truman Show. Like there was just kind of a, a slosh of them in there between those two landmark movies that I just totally missed. So this was a first watch for me. What were your memories of Liar Liar? So I saw this one with the family. I remember that they all loved it. They laughed along. Um, I've always loved Jim Carrey. I think he's great. I love both his comedy and his drama. Um, I think I've shared a thousand times on here that Eternal Sunshine is my favorite movie of all time. And I love early Carrie. Um, But I have to be very honest with you. I've really grown to hate this character the older that I've gotten. I think I found him amusing when I was younger. But as an adult, I find him really insufferable. But I was really excited to see how the two of you, two men like Jen mentioned, that I immensely respect. I was interested to see how you responded to him and how we'd approach it for the pod. For me, Jim Carrey, he was just a a movie-making machine in the 90s. There were some years he was doing multiple films. Uh, I can remember this one going to see it while I was on vacation. It was the same vacation with Event Horizon with my girlfriend. But then I went and looked at the dates, and I was like, okay, the dates don't match up. This was March of 97. Event Horizon was August. So I can no longer accurately trust my memory, I think, of where I've seen the film, because I would bet my life. But I do remember walking out of theater being very happy. I mean, the fact that you're within a couple months is pretty impressive, dude. Like, I don't I don't remember when I saw movies. I don't remember what the hell I did in 1997. Yeah, it's weird. I remember like outfits that I wore to see certain films. Like I remember the exact outfit I was wearing when I saw Gladiator for the first time. Like I remember shit like that. I don't remember necessarily like dates and times, but I remember really like tiny minutia about movie experiences. I mean, when you're wearing full Centurion regalia, that's easy to remember. Right. Uh, I can remember weather. I remember leaving the theater for uh, Edward Scissorhands, and it was snowing. It was and I was 76 lonely. degrees and partly cloudy. <laughs> we had just watched the high school team lose the basketball, like the, the, the league championship. <laughs> and I was, I was walking home, and I was just humming wow. the music. And it's, today, I hated the movie, and I don't know why. But hum, Humming the music to Liar Liar? How did that how did No, that no, 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 no. Edward Scissorhands. Oh God! Oh, what? Well, no, not this one. Okay. I was, I was no, I like that. I left the theater thinking this one was funny. Yeah. Well, I hope you enjoy this podcast with the oldest man on earth. Let's hit the trailer. We're going to share what our parents do for work. My mom's a teacher, and your dad? He's a liar. <laughs> you mean he's a lawyer? Fletcher Reed was climbing the ladder of success. You're the victim here. Driven into the arms of another man. Seven. Yeah, whatever. One lie. Tell him it's in the mail. I ran out of gas. You losing a little weight? At a time. The true victim is my client. Put yourself in his shoes for a moment. You're walking from church when suddenly you encounter him pouncing from the shadows. But what made him a successful lawyer? Your ex-wife called. I have to go to court this afternoon. Fletcher, it's his birthday. Also made him an unpredictable father. He said he was going to be here, he promised. 
Until one day, his son decided to make an honest man out of him. I wish that for only one day, Dad couldn't tell a lie. Is it good for you? <laughs> I've had better. Now... Any change, mister? Absolutely! Um, could you spare some? Yes, I could! Uh, I can't lie! All he can do is tell the truth. Like the new dress? Whatever takes the focus off your head! The whole truth. You know why I pulled you over? I changed lanes without signaling while running a red light and speeding! And nothing but the truth. It was me! Your wish came true. You mean you have to tell the truth? How are we doing this morning, Consul? I'm a little upset about a bad sexual episode I had last night. From Universal Pictures and Imagine Entertainment and the director of The Nutty Professor, Jim Carrey. Liar, liar. New in the building? Mm-hmm. Everybody's been real nice. Well, that's because you have big... Fletcher Reed is a lawyer and divorced father living in Los Angeles. He loves spending time with his young son, Max, and playing a game called The Claw. However, Fletcher has a habit of breaking promises to Max and his former wife, Audrey. Fletcher's compulsive lying has also built him a reputation as a successful lawyer at his firm. On Max's birthday, Fletcher misses Max's party to have sex with his boss, Miranda, in the hopes of making partner. Max makes a birthday wish that Fletcher would be unable to lie for an entire day, a wish that immediately becomes true. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and get this out of the way at the start as to why Fletcher annoys the shit out of me. And it's because Fletcher is a type of dad that I like to call a Disney World dad. These are dads that are only there for the good and are there legit for like none of the bad. They allow things to happen and it explodes and other people either clean it up or they pass the kid off so that they don't have to deal with the bad stuff. And a lot of the time, these people make their partner the bad guy because the bad guy for the kid is the consistent one. Now, arguably, I am not impartial here because I deal with this in my own household. My husband, because of his issues and having abandoned our kids at certain times due to his addiction, he is terrified to discipline our kids because he scared them for a while. And I'm the one that's left holding the cards. I'm the one that's the bad guy. I'm the one that has to take the iPad away or make them go to timeout. And that's what Fletcher is. He kind of pulls him. He's fun. He throws the ball a couple of times and mom's left to do the heavy lifting. And the fact that he gets a redemption story in this (laughs) movie drives me fucking crazy. So from the start, from that opening scene where he won't play with the kid because he has to work and then he pushes the kid off back on mom and mom has to deal with the fallout of him not coming to the party, like I am over him. So I don't know a lot about parenting, but I know a lot about the products of parenting because they are my friends. I think the only silver lining to this type of parent, the Disney World dad, is when kids do grow up, they understand who put in the work, like they understand who molded them into better people. And they also recognize which parent opted to just do the easy thing. Looking back now, all of my friends who grew up with Disney World dads realize those guys were clowns and they still to this day do not take their dad seriously. I don't know. I, I found myself getting pissed at Audrey. I'm like, why is she so accepting of this? When he rolls in there, I was ex- I was wanting her to drop the hammer on him. I, it, it pissed me off. I I feel like it's kind of understandable, though, because Max is so happy. I mean, again, I'm not a parent. I don't know. But seeing a thing that makes your child happy, it's very hard to push away that thing. Yeah. I mean, it's the worst thing in the world where like your kid like desperately wants to spend time with your partner. And so they go off and they have all this fun and then they come home because your partner has gotten them completely exhausted and they get dropped off in your lap and you have to deal with like the crankiness and like wind up them losing like all of their electronics before the night is over. But like, I wouldn't take away the experience because like they need those experiences. They need that time. And it's just, I agree with you, Gene. I think 100% all kids eventually wisen up. And it's also why with Disney World dads, when that kid is sick or they're hurt or they're scared, they don't go to that parent. They go to the consistent one. And I think that becomes just more and more prevalent throughout their adulthood. But it doesn't mean that they deserve a fucking redemption arc in a movie. 
So, Ash, you don't like the Disney World dad angle. I can't stand dad is too busy movies. Like, I don't know what was with the 80s and 90s with all the dad is too busy movies. We've already covered the Santa Claus, vice versa, and Jingle All the Way, which is a good one. I'm sure there are others I'm forgetting. But by 1997, like, this is a very tired genre. And sometimes I wonder if so many dad is too busy movies were made. That's the reason why today's dads who grew up watching them are like too present. Now every dad is a coach or a jump castle renter or like they take their kids to the American Girl Factory or whatever the hell it's called. I want my future children to think of me as like the back of a newspaper and some slippers. And that was dad. No, I think that, that that's just like on Instagram and social media where you think everybody's traveling and everyone's having these beautiful meals and everyone's doing these just these, these just outlandish things. It's not. It's like people will post pictures of their kids and act like they're engaged. I don't think things have changed. I still have plenty of friends who, if you looked at only their social feeds or listened to them, you would think they were actively engaged parents, but they're not. It is all a front. I think this still exists, that a lot of dads are distant. And they at least put on a front because they know after they have to pretend like they're engaged. I mean, maybe so, but I I do agree that like the helicopter parent does come out of these movies, right? I mean, and I think that we've clearly gone too far in the other direction with this whole idea that we have to be with our children 24 seven or we're terrible parents. I go through all of this mom guilt periodically because I have a job that requires me to work a lot more than 40 hours a week. And I panic about like, oh my God, oh my God, I'm not spending enough time with my kids. They're going to be, you know, murderers and degenerates on the street or something like that. And so I read a lot of medical journals and like psychology journals to try to make myself feel better. And psychologists by and large agree that kids need, are you ready for this? How many minutes they need one-on-one per day? Eight. They need eight minutes of one-on-one time with no tech, like just them and their parent. And that is how they become healthy adults. I'll say that again, eight minutes. And it is proven in psychology and in neuroscience that being with your children too often causes them to not explore the world, to be afraid of the world. And they think this is why anxiety is up almost 70% in children in recent years, because as involvement of parents has gone up, anxiety has gone up. And I see it with my own children who I am not a helicopter parent by any means, but we were just at the beach. And I have terrified my children about drowning in the water because we had a friend whose child drowned. And so like I am a helicopter parent about drowning. That is like Mm. the one thing I am a helicopter parent about. And so Finn, I had to like throw in the water basically. And Ellie screamed from the beach the entire time we were there that the water was going to, and I quote, touch her, make her float and be dead. And so I know that helicopter parenting has done that to them where they explore the world in every other way. And I think that's what we're doing to our kids. This is why you don't watch Stephen King's It with your daughter. They all float down here, Georgie. They all float. Yeah, well, she didn't. We've done enough now 90s movies here. Did, was there like a, a like 12 kids that films had to pick from? Oh, we need a child. Okay, you have a choice A, B, or C, or D. If I told most people out there, our listeners, that Justin Cooper, who plays Max, is the same kid from Home Improvement, <laughs> Jerry Maguire, and Jingle All the Way, who would be able to tell me I was lying? They're all the same generic kid. Bowl cut, annoying, Jake Lloyd looking, just kid. I, as a person who thinks all white people look the same, could tell those kids apart. Come on. Yeah. You know what the difference is? This kid is a terrible fucking actor. Like, he is terrible (laughs) in every aspect of his line delivery. I could hear the director in the background basically going, okay, Max now looks sad. He goes, okay, I'm so (laughs) sad about my dad. Please don't lie anymore. Yeah. The kid in Jerry Maguire is like a charming version of Roger. Mm -hmm. I like that kid. That kid's great. (laughs) Yeah. But Ash mentioned that we get this redemption arc with Fletcher. And at this point in the movie, I just wanted to sit down and have a heart to heart with Fletcher because he's struggling here between Max and Audrey and his career. And it's very clear what he likes. Listen, my guy, you got a hot boss who wants to make you partner and bang you at the office. This is like every dude's dream. You're really good at a job you enjoy doing. You've already gone through the divorce and your kid is big D mentioned as a terrible fucking haircut. Maybe, 
let your family go a little and do what you were destined to do. Like embrace yourself. I got to say that his office life looked a hell of a lot better than his domestic entanglements. Oh, and he keeps talking about how he loves his son. I don't know that he does. Fletcher, he is great at his job. He, if, if, if I got into trouble with the law, I want Fletcher defending me. He seems to enjoy lying. He's not just good at it. He enjoys his son when it's convenient. When he's got a couple minutes, then, oh, I'll be dad. I'll throw the ball around. I'll get you some baseball stuff, you know. But he would be the happiest if he just kept his life the way it is. Let Jerry, he's going to be present. He's going to be loving. Does he do the claw? Is he really that wild in front of a guy? No. Drop by occasionally. Live your best life. That's what he should do. It'd be best for everybody involved. But the thing that this movie does that I'm really happy with, we've complained about all these 90s movies that have like a magic curse or some kind of body switching or something. Liar Liar does not waste any time trying to tell us this is a magic fortune telling machine. There's a cursed jewel encrusted skull. They don't tell us anything. It's just all you need is like the sorrow of a sad child and the smoke from their extinguished birthday candles. That's all you need. That's it. Thank you. Comes in. Boom. Even Fletcher jokes. "Eh, It's one of those 24 hour curses that seems to be going around. (laughs) Save me five minutes. Get me in. It's not the important thing about how the curse came. It's just what it does. Big D, you missed a key component of this curse. There was also wind blowing through those curtains. I, I definitely saw that. What I don't understand is how Fletcher, who is a lawyer and an adult and an intelligent guy, his immediate conclusion is must be a curse. Like I would have <laughs> immediately gone to a neurologist or a therapist. Mm-hmm. If I woke up one day and I found that I was having speech issues that I couldn't control the things coming out of my mouth, I would think I had a brain tumor or some deep seated psychological issue that needed to be addressed. Uh, on Instagram, I saw a thing where a guy was finding post-it notes around his house. It turned out there was a gas leak. It was causing him to have like loss of memory. So maybe Fletcher wants to check for a natural gas leak. Hmm. D- did I make it clear that the post-it notes he was finding, he didn't know who had written them and he thought somebody was breaking in? I think we assumed that part. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just, just, just checking. Like, just we, checking. <laughs> we got it. It was very memento, but less permanent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the post-it note just said, you have a gas leak <laughs> and it was from the gas man. <laughs> <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> well, Fletcher soon discovers he is unable to lie, mislead, or even withhold a true answer. These incidents are inconvenient as he is fighting a divorce case, which could boost his career. His client is Samantha Cole, whose lover and main witness, Kenneth Falk, is eager to commit perjury to win. But Fletcher discovers that he cannot even ask a question if he knows the answer will be a lie. Meanwhile, Audrey is planning to move to Boston with her new fiance, Jerry, and decides that Max will go with them. So besides the overworked dad and the being a distant parent and the curse and body swapping of the 90s, the other big thing we would get is anytime there was a dad or a mom who had a job in the big city, there was always the secretary. And this secretary that we get here, Greta, who's played by Anne Hanny, she is one of the best, if not the best. She buys Max a box of, quote, baseball stuff for his birthday. She has, she buys herself something on the side, but she does it. She's on top of everything. She keeps Fletcher's mom at bay. She ultimately comes to the rescue for Fletcher when he is in jail, when he does not deserve to be. She is a great secretary. Every 40-year-old overworked dad needs one of her because without her, I don't think Fletcher could, could survive a day on his own. But I don't understand her moral compass because in this movie, For years, I can assume, she's okay with covering up Fletcher's lies until she finds out that he lied to her. And then she goes on this rant about how a lawyer did her friend dirty. So I guess she's anti-lawyer, even though she's been working for a lawyer who she knows lie. But then she comes back when she discovers he had a change of heart. Her character doesn't make any sense. I like her, but she's nonsense. Yeah, well, I mean, she also has the most unrealistic part in this movie that this kid is going to be like happy with that being his birthday gift because I was watching this with my kid and he went, that's all he's getting? He's getting a baseball glove and a hat? Yay, baseball stuff. Yeah, like, I mean, no kid is going to be like satisfied with just that. And also like, like, take him to Walmart, buy him a baseball glove. Like, that's not a birthday present. But the bigger thing is he's a Dodger fan, obviously. Why the hell does he want dad to keep being Jose Canseco? 
Wouldn't he hate the A's? He's a Dodger fan. He's got Dodger gear, but he's sweating Canseco. I feel like kids are like my brother-in-law. They're just like whoever the fucking superstar is that day. Inconsistencies. Another inconsistency is the most giant plot hole in this entire film, which is that Fletcher keeps working. Fucking go home. Ask for a continuance. And I know that there's this whole thing that he can't get it because he can't lie to get it. So claim your kid is sick and have someone lie for you. Don't lie to your secretary and say to her, like, hey, this is what's going on. I'm having like a psycho moment. Can you tell somebody that my kid is sick? She lies for him all the time. That's how this whole movie starts. Just get the trial moved. You don't have to go through any of this. If you sit at home, and only maybe order Uber Eats. You will not have learned your lesson, but like your life would be fine. That is 100% the move. Don't show up for court. If an attorney doesn't show up, it's not like his client just gets screwed, right? It's not like she loses the case. The court date gets moved. And, and the best part about this is that Fletcher could maybe lie his way into just a minor penalty, right? It's not like the bar is going to like shut him the fuck down. It would probably just be a fine of some sort and he could just move on. And yeah, I enjoyed watching Jim Carrey pull off the courtroom scenes, but sometimes there's a simple solution just screaming at us so loudly you have to call it out. Yeah, but the problem, I think, is that the the rules kind of change. So it starts off just Fletcher can't lie, but then all of a sudden he expands on things for no reason. It makes no sense. So his life becomes harder. He could just call in and say, I can't make it. But instead, he'd be like, I can't make it because there's a curse. You know, he would just give it all up. You know, that's why the movie shouldn't have been called Liar, Liar. It should have been called, like, Tell the Truth or something like that. <laughs> it's crazy. I enjoy it's funny when he gets in the elevator and the woman's like, hey, it's nice in the building, isn't it? He's like, yes, you're Hooters and starts talking about her boobs. That doesn't have anything to do with lying or when the cop pulls him over. And he just expands and says, oh, yeah, I was speeding. And then he shows the tickets. It's funny, you know, to see him just free of all like the social politeness that he normally has. But it, it doesn't stick with the plot of the movie. That's the issue. What they define as lying is fairly extreme. Like the fact that I don't tell a coworker that I hate them it, yeah. doesn't make me a liar. It makes me polite. And this is more like no filter, no filter, right? This is not liar, liar. It's. I have no social norms. I have no filter. I just want to know what's up with Big D's new obsession with the accuracy of movie titles. It like started with like Nuns on the Run. I, I think you've been <laughs> spending too much time in Sweden. It's getting into your head and you're starting to grab like those movie titles from abroad, like in Iran, where they call Mission Impossible higher than danger because the mission is, in fact, possible. Or in Slovakia, where Breaking Bad is called Meth Dad. Or in Germany, where Annie Hall was called the urban neurotic, because it's much more about Woody Allen than it is about Diane Keaton. Big D, you need to spend some more time. Go, don't go on that Brazil trip. You stay right here. Okay, I, I want to roll back something I just said there. There was one funny time when he just he blurts out something. When the judge says, uh, are we ready to go? He's like, are you okay? He's like, well, I'm a little disappointed because I had a really disappointing <laughs> sexual experience last night. I did laugh at that, though. That's like the worst joke in the movie because it puts <laughs> down a woman who had sex with him. Why yeah. does it put no? It puts him down that he didn't perform. No, because he looks at her and says, "I've had better." Yeah. Oh, but the judge doesn't know that. I think he was making it sound like he couldn't perform, like he had had some performance issues. I see you, Big D. I see you. I want to see Met Dad. That's what I want to go see. <laughs> well, Fletcher tries desperately to delay the case, but is unable to lie his way into a continuance. He still manages to win the case, earning Samantha half of her husband Richard's marital assets. However, Samantha also insists on contesting custody of their children for an extra $10,000 in monthly child support. Horrified that he's corrupted Samantha, Fletcher demands that the judge reverse the decision and he is arrested for contempt of court. Fletcher calls Audrey to bail him out, but she informs him that their plane leaves for Boston that night. His bail is eventually paid by his secretary, Greta. So just like Jen, I really did enjoy the moment where Fletcher has now realized that, yes, it is a curse. It was his son's wish. He goes to school. He tries to throw really a sad recreation of the birthday to get him to wish to undo it. And we get the joke you know, about ugly people, but that wasn't the moment that hit me. He's having a conversation with his son and he says, you know, people have to lie. Everybody has to lie. It's part of part of life. 
And Max looks at him, and even though, Ash, you, you didn't like his performance, he says, yes, Dad, but the other people's lies don't make me feel bad. That was the moment that made Fletcher realize he was a piece of shit dad and, and turn. And it did. It kind of tugged on my heartstring here. He, he felt bad for little Max. I mean, maybe what should have made him feel like a piece of shit dad was throwing a half-assed birthday party that he missed for having sex with somebody else to get something he needed out of his kid. I mean, it was pretty shitty. Um, but but yeah, I mean, it's less about lies and more about follow-through. Like, that's what matters to kids. Like, do you stick to your word? Do you follow through with what you say you're going to do? And I think most parents, they mean to follow through every time. But it doesn't always happen because shit happens. And it's devastating when you let your kid down. And that's what I did like about this scene is that he at least got to experience the devastation and Jim Carrey was good in it. But man, when your kids are disappointed in you or like when you disappoint them, hell yes, makes you nauseated. But I was kind of disappointed in Max because he's like, oh, it didn't work because I didn't really wish it this time. It's like, hey, kid, (laughs) if you don't get this right, your ass has to move to Boston. We'll never see each other again. Fucking wish, boy. Wish your ass off. You're going to community college, okay? Make a wish here, kid. Make a wish. But there's one thing about Jim Carrey. He's got a couple talents. You know, he makes the faces. He does the voices. But then there's a physical component to his humor that appears in, like, every single movie. And they almost felt obligated to put it in here. So we get the bathroom meltdown, and it felt out of place. The movie was kind of going along where they were showing that Fletcher is a brilliant lawyer. He can use his words. He can actually, he doesn't need to lie to win. He's good at what he does. So when we get this whole bathroom meltdown, I felt they missed an opportunity. Gene, you'd mentioned on So I Married an Axe Murderer. Wouldn't it have been good if they had spent the time and had him be a good poet to win her back? What if here we didn't have him beating himself up, but he had to find a way to win the case by not lying but to use his words to actually find a way to win the case not just on a clerical error not that it was just oh how did they not realize she was underage have him win the case with his wit and find a way to dance around his curse i think the movie you're looking for is a few good men (laughs) you can't handle the truth I don't know. I mean, the physical humor here is hilarious. I mean, Jim Carrey is so funny when they let him loose. And I thought, you know, the whole thing when the guy's like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm kicking my ass. Like, the delivery of that line alone was really amazing. And where it falls apart is that any judge would allow him to continue in this condition. Like, the judge wouldn't just look at him and be like, hey, it's like, are you are you sure you're brave enough to continue? Like, that, that wouldn't happen. That's bullshit. I was kind of on the fence about the the bathroom scene, but big D when he like runs down the hallway and jump kicks that door open for no fucking reason, or when he's in the courtroom and he's doing that, like Turkey getting stuffed doggy style impersonation that didn't make you laugh. Mm-hmm. A, 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 little, a little bit, a little bit. Okay. You just want jokes about how bad women were at sex. <laughs> no, no. I'm saying a little bit. I, 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 no, no, <laughs> I like this movie. I don't know what you're saying. You're making it sound like I didn't like it. I like this movie. That's your defense. I like this movie. <laughs> it was good. Big D, I think you only like jokes about women being bad at sex. I like this movie. <laughs> your honor. And women Re- are. And women are. <laughs> Recognizing Max as his highest priority, Fletcher rushes to the airport, but Audrey and Max's flight has already left the terminal. In desperation, he hijacks a mobile stairway to pursue the plane onto the runway. The plane finally stops, but Fletcher is injured after he crashes the mobile stairway. On a stretcher, Fletcher vows to Max that he will spend more time with him. He points out that it's been over 24 hours since Max's birthday wish, but Max believes him. Call me the lawyer of the show here. But if she's too young to enter a contract for a prenup, then isn't she also too young to enter a marriage contract? Because marriage is a contract. You both sign it. So wouldn't it be both null and them never actually have been married so she wouldn't be able to get any of his stuff i mean unless it's common law marriage but was i the only person really confused by this i was confused by that and i was confused by how this supposedly great lawyer who had to review boxes and boxes of paperwork while canceling wrestling night with his son somehow missed the tiny detail 
of Samantha lying about her age. It, and the whole process of discovery literally is the most time consuming part of a divorce case. And it's what the attorneys are actually paid for. It's hard to believe that neither Richards nor Samantha's lawyer identified an age discrepancy ahead of time. Well, what about statutory rape? The age of consent in California is 18. Is it? I think there's going to be another trial. Yes, it is. I, I look, again, Google came here. Yes, it is. I got some phone calls to make. <laughs> Eight, yeah, exactly. He, forget, he's, forget about him being a good dad. He's going to jail. Shout on retainers. He's going to jail. Big D, I'm glad you're back with us because ever since The Wedding Singer, we've been swimming in races to the airport, and I know you love a good airport race. What I, I don't it. understand about this one is cell phones exist. And also, Audrey and Max, they're just going to look at houses. It's not like they're moving forever. They're going to be back in like a few days, and you could talk then. I don't understand why Fletcher, a lawyer, is committing multiple crimes and risking his life to stop a passenger jet when he knows those passengers are going to be right back in like a couple days. Yeah, if I'm Audrey, like this is the biggest red flag on the planet for me because everything is always about Fletcher. Like this is such a narcissistic thing to do. He makes the world about him. And this is a perfect example of that narcissism because like the whole movie, he can't have time for his son. And now that he's decided he has time, he has to make sure like to like stop an entire flight of people. This dude's not good. No, he's getting disbarred. He has to get this part. He's going to lose his career. And this is worse than vice versa, where we have the vice president of, of whatever the hell that department store was jamming out, stealing a motorcycle from a police cop and then going on a high speed chase with your son. Audrey, you just bailed him out. There's no way you're going to forgive him. But it, this curse, Gene, I think this simple birthday wish could end existence on this planet. If we've seen if you spread, OK, if say he made the wish. I wish for the next 24 hours, no one could lie. Do we agree the world would end? Civilization needs lies to function. If everybody told everyone what they were thinking, nothing could function. This movie's definition of lies? Absolutely. Think about countries dealing with each other. Or kids, parents who like maybe didn't love their kids. Oh, I wish you weren't born. Or to your wife, ah, oh, I've been having sex with your sister. All marriages would end. Like would every end marriage instantly. would end. Because like part of like the reason why people stay together is they learn not to say certain things to each other. Like, hey, the look of your face today makes me want to die. Oh, not yesterday, might- not tomorrow, just today. Because it passes. Uh, I haven't been attracted to your body in 20 years. Yeah. Like that. The, can you imagine that? Or like the no. just anything. The kids There's a reason hear- we haven't had sex. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Do you remember that night back in 1965? Yeah, I was with your brother and two of his friends. Like, oh, it would be devastating. It's like coming out of anesthesia. Do you know that they intentionally keep spouses apart when they bring you out of anesthesia because of how honest people are when they come out of anesthesia and people are just like, yo, I'm so glad I'm fucking the pool boy instead of my (laughs) husband lately. That's probably a smart thing to do then. What, fuck the pool boy instead of your husband? (laughs) No, just, yeah, keep that part separate. I don't know if he looks like Kenneth. Ultimately, Audrey and Max decide not to move to Boston with Jerry, who goes on his own to run a hospital. One year later, Fletcher and Audrey are celebrating Max's birthday, and Max makes a birthday wish only to find that Fletcher and Audrey are kissing. Fletcher asks Max if he wished for them to get back together, but Max says he only wished for rollerblades. The family returns to normal as Fletcher chases Audrey and Max around the house with the claw. Now that I'm in my 40s, I know lots of parents who are divorced and they still do a great job raising their kids together. Even some of them refer to each other as not my like ex, but my parenting partner. Liar Liar establishes early on that Fletcher and Audrey aren't right for each other and they recognize that, but they both love Max. And Audrey even has this great line about Fletcher's life. She says, I don't care. That's the magic of divorce. And I thought that was a very cool, very mature message for a Jim Carrey comedy. But then they have to rekindle the romance, which just made it feel like every other absent dad comedy. Yeah, because here's the deal, guys. Spoiler alert to those of you who are young. People don't change like we want them to. And they may in like microcosm type ways. 
but they don't. Like they just don't inherently change what their priorities are. And it's okay. Those are their priorities. It's totally fine that Fletcher wants to work and that's the most important thing to him. That's all right. But let your kid and your ex-wife go have a better life with somebody that that isn't their priority, right? Some people just aren't meant to be together in the end. And here's the thing. I have not fought a lot in front of my kids with my spouse. But Big D, I'm sure you can relate to this. Sometimes it just happens. And there were two really bad fights that we had not like. Nobody was throwing shit. But like fights, real fights that we had in front of our children. And our son brings those up all the time. They frightened him so badly. And again, Nobody was hurt. Like it was just yelling. And it caused so much damage to them in a way that I never thought that it would. So much so. But like, even when I'm ready to tear my husband's head off, we're like, okay, why don't we talk later? You know, because we don't ever want to do that to them again. And again, we're talking about two, maybe three times. So I get why not being together would be better for some families. And Here's the deal. It's only a matter of time before the next promotion comes along or the next firm comes along that wants Fletcher, you know, to be a hotshot lawyer and he goes back to his old ways. And worse is at this point, probably a new kid's going to be added to the mix and you're compounding shit. Just get divorced or say divorced. Yeah, it would be, it would be the best thing for Max. I agree. Fletcher doesn't deserve the happy ending no. he gets. That's my biggest issue with this movie. Sure, he had a shitty day. A shitty 24 hours. That's it. But does that make him deserve to have his entire family back? I don't think so. I don't believe he actually did enough self-discovery in 24 hours to undo 30 plus years of narcissism. Because here's the big tell, is that he looks at this poor little boy, and here's the deal, guys. Kids worship their parents, whether they're good to them or not. They don't know that their parents aren't good to them until they become adults and need copious amounts of like therapy, right? And so Max, no matter what, is going to accept his daddy. But he looks at him, And Jim Carrey's character has to say, oh, wait, but the curse is gone. But wait, make sure you believe me. The fact that he had to even question that and whether or not his kid would believe him shows that he's done way more damage than 30, you know, than 30 hours, 24 hours is going to undo. Jim Carrey is so likable in this movie. He's hilarious in it. But this character is just insufferable. Okay, question for the pod. At what age is it okay to act full adult, full unfiltered adult around your child or a child, right? Is it, is it 18? Is it 21? Is it 16? Like, where do you draw the line? Where do you think you would be comfortable just being yourself in front of your kid completely? I think it happens in increments. I don't think it happens all at once. And I think it depends on the kid because some kids take the adultness and they internalize that and become adult themselves, right? But some kids need that. So like Ellie, Ellie is psychotic. Like I cannot be an adult in front of Ellie until she is on birth control and can drink legally because Ellie will do everything that I imitate in front of her. But like Finn, Finn needs me to be an adult from time to time because he needs that logic and that reason. So like my grandmother died today and we were on the phone when she died. I made Ellie go away and Finn stayed with me and watched her pass away because he needed that. He needed that adult moment to realize that she wasn't there, to see her body and realize she wasn't there anymore, right? So I think it just depends. Like I think yeah. that it, it's an incremental thing. It's not a choice that you make like all at once. Yeah, I think you have moments because there's times where like today I had a I went with Emma to the park and we were just laying in the grass and we were looking up at the clouds and we were just having like a, a conversation. It was like a chill moment. We were just talking and I realized how much she understands mm-hmm. that she's six years old, but there's things that she gets now that you can feel the conversation shifts. So I don't think that Jean, to answer your question, I don't think there's a definitive answer. It just kind of happens as you realize they can understand things. You know, when it's not, When you're running through an airport illegally after not being able to lie for 24 hours and stopping your ex-wife and son going away, because he's so adult in this moment with this kid. This is a kid who wished for you not to lie and then later wishes for rollerblades. Like, this is not some mature, like, savant-type child. This is not the time to be an adult, Fletcher. 
No, and the worst part I just thought of is that he, he wished for him not to lie, and then Dad comes and begs you to let him lie again. Mm-hmm. To undo the wish even makes it worse that you don't care about what your son says. But I think that Audrey, maybe she deserves Fletcher. They seem like a good pair because how do we not address Jerry? Okay, Jerry, yes, he's beta. He's a bit, he's not, you know, the big high powered attorney, but he's a loving father figure to Max. There's nothing he wouldn't do for Max. Does Audrey even think about that once? No, because it's never been about Max. It's about her. She still likes and feeds off of Fletcher. You can see she's attracted to him. He doesn't even get a goodbye. She forgets about Jerry in an instant and he is gone. He says, I love you. And she kind of like blows it off. She, she discards him like a used napkin. She just throws him out without a second thought. There's no guilt. You didn't even give this man an on screen goodbye. This bothers me on some level that I can't even explain because it should have been about the love of Max. But in the end, it wasn't. It was about what Audrey wanted in a partner. Beta? I think he's beta. Hey, it's the claw. I think, he, I think he's got some big dick energy here because he's so uh, confident. Like the thing about Jerry is he's a perfectly good dude. He doesn't even push too hard, right? He's perfectly okay with leaving for Boston by himself. He just wanted to give Audrey the option. And when it was time to let go, he did. Like this is this is a confident man. This is a guy who's got his shit together. And also he's Carrie Elwes and therefore hot. And if anyone dares to remake The Princess Bride, I will devote an entire season of Shat on The New Princess Bride to roasting them for their stupid movie. Don't touch it. Yeah, I would burn the world down if they remade that film. But I agree with you. Carrie Elwes is super hot, but not in this movie. Like, ugh. He's the guy that like you meet in a bar who's really nice and says he wants to meet your mom after like the second date. Office sex with Fletcher or Jerry? Who are you going with? Fletcher. Yeah, wow. Fletcher. Fletcher, yeah. Wow. No, who am I raising a kid with? Jerry. But with a really unsatisfying sex life for the remainder of my life. Yeah. Do you do you picture Jerry like talking dirty and really just getting into it? Like 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 dirty, grimy no. sex. Dirty for him is like, your face is so beautiful when I caress it this way while I make love to your whispering eye. Uh, I picture him taking off his khakis and folding them up and putting them on the edge of the bed mm. as he, he has sits sex down with to like that that full body like underwear and just his dick comes <laughs> through the little hole because you know he can't let you see his pubic hair because that's no. against Jesus's rules. See, I've got him pinned as the kind of guy that shows up to munch box with like a fucking coal miner's cap and a lunch box. Like he's going down there for a while and he ain't coming back till the job's done. That's not Jerry. Om nom nom. Mm. That's not true. Now is the time in the podcast to give our wipe score for liar liar. Our wipe score is our way of telling you how many wipes this movie takes to get out for your respective But Zero Wipes is a perfect movie. It is a 90s comedy that includes a blooper reel because why not? Five Wipes is an absolute disaster. It's every dad who tried to imitate the claw with his kids after seeing this fucking movie. Big D, we'll start with you. I know my score here isn't going to match what people are going to think from the, the, the podcast, but I thought it was funny. I thought it was one of his better films. Yes, the character is is despicable. I couldn't like him as as a man, but as a character, I thought he was funny. He was a competent professional Ace Ventura. I thought it was it was it was well done. The plot moved along. The first half there was a lot of laughs for me. Uh, the second half, I I didn't like the bathroom, you know, the physical antics. But overall. I was pleasantly surprised that it held up. I think that this was the fast paced comedy that Jim Carrey, the throw in the lines out. I thought this was as close to Apex Carrey as there was. I think it's a 1.25 white movie for me. Wow. That's strong. Um, For me, this is not Jim Carrey's best, Um, but I don't think it's his fault. His physical comedy is so funny in this. He's really funny in this. But the movie as a whole, I don't think it's because I just don't think Fletcher is a likable character. I loved the blooper reel for this movie. I laughed more in the credits than I did in the actual film because Jim Carrey is fucking hilarious. He is so good. But this movie, I I don't think is as good as he is. Um, So it's a little below average for me. It reminds me, just like Hot Sauce Steve said, of really terrible Jim Carrey films like Yes Man. And I'm not a huge fan of Bruce Almighty either. I think it's a little below average. And I think it's fine. It's not a harmful film. I just don't think it's his best film. So for me, it's three wipes. 
I'm going to wiggle right somewhere in the middle there. Th- this movie was exactly what I expected it to be. It's just an average 90s comedy with a few laughs, a few cringe moments of misogyny and cultural insensitivity, and Jim Carrey really stretching some jokes. Uh, having a son as a major part of a Jim Carrey movie is a mistake on its face. You need to not do that because what that does is limits his ability to go to the truly dark places that make his comedy shine. Like we saw in The Cable Guy, right? Jim Carrey needs to be in a slightly more adult film. That's where he can do his best work. So for me, it's two and a half wipes. And with two and a half wipes from me, three wipes from Ash, and one and a quarter wipes from Big D, that gives us an average wipe score of 2.25 wipes for Liar Liar. So Gene, with a score of 2.25 wipes, that now ties this in the 140 spot with True Romance, Clerks, and The Final Countdown. Slightly better than Rocky Four and Point Break. And slightly worse than A League of Their Own and The Usual Suspects. Wow. This is your fault, Dick. It is. You You way overrated this. I adore you, but you way overrated this. You think this movie is almost as good as Red Dawn? Yeah, as the comedy goes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, I mean, Fucking we're we're missing on. a little of that, you know, red, white, and blue patriotic flag waving. But as a comedy, yes, yes, I did enjoy this. Well, speaking of red, white, and blue flag waving, Big T, we have an um actually that came in about your comments regarding Top Gun Maverick. The ridiculous assets owned by the Admiral's daughter make 100% sense when you realize that Maverick was vaporized in the Mach 10 explosion, and the rest of the movie is him in purgatory, working through the issues from his life. So why not have fun, expensive toys? He's that close to heaven. New movie request. Have y'all done Major Pain yet? If not, I'd like to grab it for whenever. And Big D still owes me a rewatch on Clue. John. So Ash, what do you think of this theory that the reason the Admiral's daughter uh maverick's love interest has the yacht and the bar and the porsche is because uh maverick is actually in purgatory because he was vaporized i think it would make a lot more sense than a lot of the plot of top gun maverick so i'm here for it and big d what about major pain oh of course nobody's commissioned it yet but that'd be great get some damon waynes get some kids get some military discipline i think it'd be great to do it's a great movie and have you rewatched Clue since you lambasted it on this podcast? Uh, I have not. I have a long list of things that I would like to accomplish before rewatch Clue, but I promise before my death, I will rewatch Clue. Well, next up, we have an email from Justin about The Hitcher. When Justin writes in and says, my name is Justin G. I just started listening. Love the show. I've been a movie holic since I was four when Christopher Reeves convinced me a man could fly. The older I get, the more I watch the movies I grew up on. I have five bookshelves full of DVDs and Blu-rays from the 70s and 80s. One movie that everyone ducks is the original Hitcher from 1986 with C. Thomas Howell, Rucker Hauer, Jennifer Jason Lee. And I remember being 10 years old renting it from the mom and pop video store by my house. The first 10 minutes was absolutely chilling. Not sure if you covered it yet. No horror documentaries have covered it. Would love to hear you guys dissect it. Thanks, Justin. This movie terrified me. This is a, a dark, twisted tale. Of, of life on the open road, of not picking up hitchhikers. I remember this terrifying me as a kid. And whenever we would be out, my family driving, and there'd be somebody hitchhiking, the hair on my neck would stand up because of what happens. So Hot Sauce Steve, if you're listening out there, get a group commission together and get Justin his hitcher. I'd love to do it. Well, Gene, we also have a, uh, a voicemail this week uh, from the other side of the pond. What's up, Shot Crew? My name's Phil, I'm calling from Northern Ireland. Um, I hope you're well. I just thought I would finally take the opportunity to say how much I love your podcast. Today has been one year exactly since I started listening. Uh, I started listening on a a big road trip tour of Ireland with my uh, son. And I've been listening regularly ever since. And I can't believe you guys are doing So I Married an Axe Murder this week. What a movie. It just takes me right back to when I was 19. And I, (laughs) here, what do you hear this? I spent five nights, consecutive nights in the cinema watching this movie every night when I was hiding from a a stalkerish girlfriend that I didn't want to see while she drove around town with my sister in the car looking to probably beat me up. So anyway, yeah, that's what makes me, that's what I think of when I think of So I Married an Axe Murderer. Uh, probably not a brilliant film, but so enjoyable. 
just silly and fantastic and you gotta love Mike Myers in that era but I'm starting to ramble now so I'm gonna wrap this up you guys are fantastic the podcast keeps getting better and better um, one thing I need to criticise why have you not done Stranger Things you need to do Stranger Things do a retrospective or something and catch up and do it now uh, I think it'll be fantastic I'd love to hear your insight on that Anyway, I'll go now, and thank you very much. Brilliant. Keep it up. Phil wrote to us and was super bummed out that he didn't make the So I Married an Axe Murder episode. And I hate to ruin the podcast magic for y'all, but when we're doing TV in particular, so we're doing Westworld right now, we have to record these episodes a couple weeks in advance so we have enough time, you know, whenever we find five minutes here or there to edit movies kind of gradually. We can't really, you know, get to them as as quickly as we'd like to because we have the three episodes of TV to do as well. So, Phil, we did get your voicemail. We did want to include it on the pod. We just, by the time we got it, so I married an axe murder was already in the bank. We all are aware of the negative that like social media has had. It's done a lot to tear people apart. The fact, the good side that someone is driving around on a road trip in Northern Ireland and listening to the three of us talk about 40-year-old movies. This never could have happened without the technology. It makes me happy. It makes me feel like I have friends. I was just in Sweden, and one of our wonderful listeners, Noel, reached out and said, hey, I could spend a couple hours taking you around and showing you the town. And it, it just it warmed my heart to think about the friends we've made out there and I appreciate you all. Gene, Ash, I love you both. And all of our listeners, thank you for being part of this. It's expanded and brought something to my life that I never thought I would have had. Ash, you want to address the Stranger Things thing? I mean, it, is it good anymore? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, so so I've gotten mixed reviews on this because because people have said that, that season four is, is decent. But I got to tell you, Phil, I liked season one. I loved season one. I did too. Season two was pretty good season three i i couldn't hang and i feel like a lot of people who watch westworld same same like storyline but but really i had a hard time with it so i don't know if i'll ever get around to uh to, to finishing that one but there's so much there's so much new stuff coming out that uh i don't yeah. know doing a retrospective unless it's buffy i don't know I'm, oh jesus make it so um no i mean season three it was fine for me season four felt like a car that wouldn't start they really wanted it to start but it just never did so there you go, Phil. There's our coverage of uh, Stranger Things. <laughs> That's it for this uh, week's voicemails and email, Gene. But next week, uh, we are going to a place that uh, I don't even know what to say about it. Puckaroo Banzai is caught with his trusty allies, the Hong Kong Cavaliers, in a battle to the death between evil red aliens and the good black aliens from Planet 10. Led by demonic dictator John Worfen who has taken over the body of Italian scientist Dr. Emilio Lizardo, the aliens try to get the overthruster back from Buckaroo Banzai. But the good black aliens are willing to destroy Earth rather than let these renegades return to their planet. This is commissioned by Brian. I don't know what the hell I just said. I don't know what any of this means, but I'm going to. Well, thank you, Brian, for commissioning the upcoming movie. And thank you to Andy, Hot Sauce, Steve, Jen, and Sarconic for commissioning Liar Liar. That concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media, share with a friend. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shat the Movies. You can email us, host at shatthemovies.com. Support the podcast by shopping our Amazon affiliate link, buying our merch, or commissioning your own movie. Find all that information by visiting our website, shatpod.com. Also, while you're there, you can use the SpeakPipe feature to leave us a voicemail like Phil did. You can also check out our sister podcast, Shout on TV, where we review TV series such as Lovecraft Country, Westworld, True Detective, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, and Watchmen. Find all the information on our website, shatpod.com slash TV. Wherever we're fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by iTunes, please leave us a five-star review. That helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co-hosts, Ash and Big D, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us next week for the following movie. He's a rocker. Doctor. Don't talk on that. You never know what I might be attached to. Inventor. Activate oscillator. Open the sound barrier. Philosopher. No matter where you go, there you are. And the only hero. Buckaroo. 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 Curse are you, bonsai! Who can save us all? Evil. You are unstoppable from the eighth dimension. Burn him! Launch thermal pod. Buckaroo bonsai is pure nutty fun. Buckaroo, you forgot your thruster. What are you all on for what? 
The cult sci-fi classic. Run, run! In a dimension all its own. Real life Martians are landing in New Jersey. Holy Torito! We will fire a portable beam weapon. Vaporize the whole damn planet? If we blow this today, get him up. There ain't no tomorrow. Left, I said left. This is left. I mean my right left. Your left goes your right. Parker, the president's calling about is everything okay with the alien space club and planet 10, or should we just go ahead and destroy Russia? Tell him yes on one and no on two. The Adventures of Buckaroo Bonsai. Which was yes, destroy Russia or uh, number two? 